good morning everybody or good afternoon now as it is here in the UK we're just going to let uh, give people a few minutes to uh, get into the session before we uh, start a couple of minutes and then we'll uh, we'll make a start so please stand by callers <laughs> few people in there now. So we'll just give people a few more seconds to, to join. A few familiar faces in there. Hi, James. Hi, Christian. Hi, Mark. Mr. Nelson. Hi, Tom. Morning, Sandy. Okay. Just one or two more people joining. It's kind of too many, Jamie, or I'll get too nervous. <laughs> Up to the, after almost 40, the number of viewers are increasing by the second. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's make a start then. So a very good uh, afternoon to you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the security stream. This is the first security session of the day. And uh, in a moment, I'll hand over to Henry, who's going to take us through a very, I'm, I'm really intrigued about this topic, mainframes and uh, malware. Um, so for the purpose of feedback, this is session 5AN. Uh, so don't forget that and the QR code, uh, Henry's put on the bottom of the screen there where you can use your QR reader to scan that and take you directly to the, the feedback. Um, just a couple of uh, points. Um, on the 4th of February, I've mentioned this a couple of times now in, the, in the, the security sessions, we have the next security working group meeting, it will be the first meeting of 2021, and that is going to be virtual um, exclusively and uh, over Zoom, so that's the 4th of February 2021, a security stream, full day of uh, security sessions, um, and which I think I've already managed to convince Henry that I need to sign him up for a session there. <laughs> So uh, if you are looking to, uh, if you'd like uh, to present for that meeting, please do come forward, send me an email at jamie.ps at gse.org.uk. Um, and I know one or two of you have already uh, emailed me uh, asking you know, if you can present. So I will get back to you on that, I promise. Um, so I don't know about you, but uh, malware, you hear horror stories every day uh, that, you know, uh, that, that, that computers and uh, things are being infected by it. But who would have thought, is it really possible for a mainframe to, uh, to get malware? Well, Henry's going to kind of enlighten us, I feel. So uh, over to you, Henry, and welcome back, by the way, to, uh, to GSE. Thank you very much, Jamie. Good morning at least from now good afternoon from me and i think noon for the uk people i don't even know what time it is at the other end of the puddle but welcome and um, thanks for joining this session um yeah like jamie said we're going to be talking about mainframes and malware um i do want to remind you um for the charity cause gse uk has selected this year so if you like this session donate some money if you don't like the session donate some much money too um, and let's get this presentation on the road. I'm going to boot this up here. <coughs> Sorry. Um, it just takes a while to start up. Um, first, we start with a disclaimer. Like, like Jamie said, malware is, is like all around us. And a little while back, I started wondering, would that run on our precious mainframe? And how scared do we need to be? So um, I did some research and followed a lot of sessions and, and read a lot of stuff on, on malware that's prevalent on, you know, the, the other platforms like, you know, the, the x86 Windows and Linux machines. Um, so yeah, just to be sure, this has all been done for an educational purpose only. Um, I never touched real production systems with the, the stuff that I wrote. And if anybody's too scared or too, I don't know, curious, um, I hope you'll understand that I'm not really willing to share all the source code that I've crafted for this. So let's continue. 
Um, just a little heads up. Um, the feedback link is at the top there. Um, you can contact me through Twitter or LinkedIn. You can send me an email as well. Um, for those of you who don't know me, a quick who am I? Um, I'm Henry. Um, I work for a company called Set DevOps, which is group four here on this system. I'm also the technical coordinator for the GuideShare Europe and then the Dutch region. Um, I'm an IBM Z champion and I'm the founder of Ziggy, a tool you probably heard about or not, but it's something that does Git for the ISPF environment. So um, please ask your questions in between. I don't know if Jamie said that because I was too nervously looking at all the people joining this session, but um, if you have a question, please type it out in the chat or if you're really bold, unmute yourself and just ask it. I don't know if people are capable of unmuting themselves, but um, as long as you don't shout uh, <laughs> all at once, that'll be all right as well. I'll try and keep an eye on the chat as well on my other monitor, but if I miss something, I think someone will shout out. Yeah, I, I just that's a good point, Henry, on the chat. So if you do want to speak with Henry, just in the chat, just say, please unmute my line. I have a question and then we'll, uh, I'll happily do that for you. Thanks. So mainframes and malware. What are we going to talk about today? Um, like the guy from, uh, what is it, that pirate movie, like an agenda is more like a guideline than an actual rule. Depending on questions, this might go a totally different route. Um, but I wanted to take you through a little recap on malware. So we're all on the same page when what we mean when we talk about malware. Um, then I want to share with you some malware tricks that I found um, in various malware that's around on, um, on like the Windows platform. And then how my quest on is this possible on ZOS? And if so, what do we need to do? So when we go to Wikipedia, we can read that malware is any software intentionally designed to cause damage to a computer, right? And then we're talking about viruses, worms, Trojans, horses, ransomware, adware, rogue software, scareware, um, a lot of bad stuff. And of course, intentionally causing damage is not something you would program in, you know, the enterprise from a, um, uh, from a design point, right? Because in, in our enterprise, mainframe software, we hopefully don't write stuff that intentionally is designed to cause damage, although sometimes unintentional damage will occur, right? We are not covering that bit. Um, so if we look at a, a typical malware rap sheet, um, try to plot a bit what, um, you know, what all the various malwares do and how you could classify them based on that Wikipedia page on worms and adware. Um, as you can see, I don't have Trojans here. For me, a Trojan is more of a distribution mechanism than actual malware, um, so I left it out. But we can take a look at, um, at the various forms, right? A virus, the most prevalent malware that all rings a bell and resonates with us, I think, um, infects other programs or other systems. Um, and usually it also self-replicates, right? So it, it kind of copies itself into something else and then that gets, well, you get the drill. Worms don't do that, right? Worms only, only copy themselves. They just make copies of themselves. Um, adware is something I think we've all seen, you know, you get too many pop-ups on your browser or you can win a marvelous prize and their major scheme is money-making. Right? They, they usually don't break stuff on your computer, but they show you ads so that the people who, you know, get money for when those ads get shown, make some money. Spyware obviously is, <clears throat> sorry, information gathering. Sometimes it's also data theft, to be honest. Um, ransomware, the biggest scare lately, right? It hijacks your data. It sometimes steals your data as well. Um, definitely a money-making machine. And then a lot of other malware is something that I, I collect under the column of annoyware. Um, back, back, back in the day when I was still young, um, there was a lot of annoyware, right? You would get stuff on your PC and the CD-ROM drawer would keep opening and closing or it started beeping or sometimes when you type an E, it turns into an A. Usually those things infect and replicate around your system, but they don't really break anything. They just annoy you, at least me. So hopefully we can spot the differences here on the various, um, you know, malware types. 
top left, of course, our worm. Um, it keeps copying itself. And in the metaphor for these lovely sweets, because I love those sweets, um, the only solution for that type of malware is just to keep eating them, right? Or deleting them off your system. Um, bottom right, we see um, a screen from WannaCry, one of the well, a big piece of malware that was um, much in the news over the last couple of years. Bottom left, we see that ad where, you know, you've won something at Tesco's or Asda or, you know, and the more you click, the more pops up, the more, um, you know, ads get shown or you need to fill out this thing and click five buttons and then you can download this, I don't know, movie thing. Um, and all those ad views will add up to them, you know, the money maker at the end of the malware designer. Top right, obviously the viruses. Um, and I think we all know what those mean. Uh, these three should probably mean something to you as well. Top left, spam. And the right, the Trojan horses, like I said, those two things for me are more of a distribution mechanism than actual malware. Although sometimes, you know, the malware will start spamming other people. Um, but I left that out of my, my, my research. And then we have exploits, right? And exploits are the, the bane for the malware because um, they use the exploits on various machines uh, and operating systems to, to do their nasty things, basically. Um, you could also call them bugs. That's, I think that's why there's a little bug in the exploit sign. In there, no, we're all good. So um, usually this is done live and we can have a proper interaction, but just to get you thinking, when was the first ransomware attack ever, right? Was that this century, previous century, 80s, 70s, 60s, 80s? Um, I found it was 1989, and that is um, quite a long time ago. Um, and maybe anybody cares or remembers, there's probably a, some people in this group who um, are old enough to, to remember this. Um, but it was called AIDS. I didn't pick the name. I think if the malware would have written today, we would have called it Corona, probably. Um, but it infected your autoexec.bat file. This is you know, ancient PC times. And it kept a little counter. And at the 90th time you would boot up your machine, it would encrypt all your file names and show you, a, you need to pay us now to get your files back. And it looked like this. Um, and it's red, just like WannaCry, but this is like the, 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 I don't know, patient zero of WannaCry ransomwares, 1989. Um, if you're keen on trivia, um, I joined the um, pop quiz, I would call it last Tuesday. There will be one again next Tuesday. Um, maybe this question will be in that pop quiz. I don't know, it might be fun. I've contacted a couple of other speakers from um, from this conference to to add some trivia to their slides decks as well. So um, maybe if you have joined this session and their session and joined the pub quiz, you have at least a chance of getting some questions right on the on the mainframe category of questions. Right, just some recent news, and this is really recent, as you can see, November fourth. Um, the ransomware gang are evil right they're, they're probably very evil has acquired the kapot malware well funny it was funny for me because kapot is sounds like kapot which is dutch for broken um pretty funny and they claim to have earned 100 million um with malware activities mostly ransomware and they paid 6500 dollars for the kapot malware on some russian i don't know like auction site the dark web, probably. Um, the article was was a bit of a funky read. You know, it said um, a lot of forum members think they overpaid for it was too much. I think sixty five hundred for a piece of malware is too much as well. But um, their um, you know their spokesperson basically said in an interview, well, we don't really care because we make a hundred million from ransom demands each year. You can find that whole um, article at the link at the bottom. And the major thing that um, stuck with me was this quote, which is that the gang of um, are evil. They don't fear law enforcement that much, but they do fear assassinations, right? So um, 
that's malware for you. So now we all get what malware does. Right? We're all hopefully sortfully on the on the same page. Um, we're still doing good on time. So how do they do it, right? How does this malware get on your laptop, your machine, your desktop? Hopefully not your mainframe, right? <clears throat> so somebody has written a piece of malware, let's call it malware version 1.0. There's a, usually a user who's you know totally in the dark about this malware, um, who works with some computer and gets that malware from somewhere. Um, so it runs on that computer. That's not too hard, right? This, um, this is a one shilly difficulty scale, I'd say. Um, so how do we get that user? Like I, like I said, those things for me are more of a distribution mechanism, right? Those spam emails with links you want to click. Click here for, I don't know, a newest video of Boris Johnson coughing. Um, Trojan horses, sometimes it's even good enough to just, you know, toss around some USB sticks on the parking lot and people will insert them in their computer. That's all the, the, the infection, the start of the malware. I, um, I did a lot of research in how that works. There's a lot of like, you know, offensive, what is it, offensive uh, intelligence gathering, OSINT kind of stuff and, you know, psychological attacks on people to make them run the malware. We are not gonna discuss that here today. Um, I was more interested in, you know, the actual exploits, the actual code that's written to do all these, these, these things to make that malware run on the target computer. So after looking at a, some different malware out in the wild that have been analyzed by malware analyzers, they have really cool um, presentations on it as well. I kind of picked three things that I thought were pretty amazing um, and then tried to see if I could replicate that on ZOS. You might wonder why I just have a lot of time, right? Um, so the first thing that caught my eye was that most malware um, utilizes what they call obfuscation, right? They, it's, they, they make their code, their malware code, very hard to read. Now, this is something that happens in the enterprise world as well. Sometimes you get a piece of COBOL code or PL1 or even a Rex where you're thinking, what's going on here, right? But um, I think those things are not intentionally obfuscated. Um, unless it's Professor Schnitzel who has done it to um, further obfuscate things. But that's one of the tricks that I've seen happening in malware. Another one is that they try to actually hide their code, right? Sometimes they're not as good at it, like, like this boy here, um, but they really, they don't even make it hard to read. They make it hard to find, like where, where is the executable coming from? <coughs> Sorry. Um, that's being run to, to do the various things that, that the malware does. And then of course, the popular one is self-replication. Um, this is in the, you know, in the league of viruses or viri if you want. Um, and I've done some, some checks on that as well. So let's start by making sure that all these things don't run on a mainframe. So we start with obfuscation. Um, it is the art of making something obscure, unclear, or unintelligible, right? So just, it is there, it's in your face, you just don't know what the code is doing. It makes it hard for, an, um, for a malware analyzer, like if you're looking at the code to see what it does. It also makes it hard for tools, you know, static code analyzers and stuff to, to, to actually see what's going on. And we usually see things like this. Right, this is, um, I have to look again. This is some, I think, some Visual Basic script that runs the albert.exe, probably. Um, but there's a lot of stuff going on. You don't really, it's, it's not really apparent straight away what's going on here. Then there's, um, you know, the obfuscation in, in JavaScript. Um, sometimes it's called minifying as well, but. Um, I mean, this is code you can't read, right? Um, I don't expect all of you to be able to read JavaScript, but I do expect everybody to go, what the F is going on here? <clears throat> if you want to take a look at how that, that transformation looks like, at the top left, you see um, a set text function. And, you know, at the B below that, you, um, 
you can kind of see that they, you know, made this code hard to read. Um, at like one to like the third line, you see A equals S C V O V D H, like a string of random text, and then that B value, G Z T X L E went safe, whatever that means. That kind of looks like get element by ID from that top function. And as you can see, they do a lot of replace functions on texts and variables and things to, to reconstruct that code. But of course, that code that you see at the you know, at block A is not the code that's going to end up on your system. It's that block at the bottom. So that is pretty hard to read, hard to understand. And, you know, can you run this safely or not? Well, the top one is easier to judge than the bottom one. So basically, if you want to run some successful obfuscation, you need to fool the reader, which is either the computer preferably the computer, but also, you know, the, the human reader of that code to, um, to not see the difference, right? You might wonder what those two things at the top are. I hope my demo will work because I pre-recorded this for you. Um, I wrote my most intelligent Python script ever that basically says print hello world that we can run. And of course we can all assume what will happen it'll print hello world. But then you can obfuscate that code as well. And that may, then it looks like this, which is gibberish, right? It's a, at least a lot more complex than the one liner print hello world. So we are like, what, what is that stuff? But if you run it, it'll just say hello world. Um, pretty weird stuff. For those of you who don't want to pause the video afterwards and type it, I've got the full code in the slides here. I do believe this is text and not a picture. Otherwise, you just have to you know, type. But um, if you run the left side or the right side, it will do the same thing in Python. Python runs on ZOS. So basically, mission one is accomplished. We can obfuscate code on ZOS. Um, or can we? Can we do that with Rex? Can we do that with, I don't know, a piece of COBOL or a piece of PL1? Um, you know, the, the, the Rex version of that Python hello world script, you see it at the top left. Um, basically you say hello world, then some more complex Rex at the bottom that gets some system variables and, you know, gets the output from your um, RACF information on your user. And maybe we can obfuscate this code to look completely different and make it look like this, right? And, and if that would run, that would be, would be pretty awesome if you could run this rec script and it still did the same thing. So let's try, let's try a demo. I hope you can all see this. I think you do. Log on here. Looks beautiful, Henry. You can see it nice and clear. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, so I've prepped some malware. Now, where are we? Um, right, just so we're on the same page. This is that Rex that says hello world. And I hope we can all get that when I execute this, it will say hello world. But what about this script? Right, and maybe I should open it in edit mode to really bring it home. Let's do view so I don't break it. What is going on here? Right, we see some reads and we see a weird unp function and a sysdob function and some, some gibberish up top. The editor even warns us that, oh, you've got non-displayable characters here. This might not be a good Rex file, right? But when we execute this, it says hello world. Pretty amazing. Now we take that other script. Uh, I'll just go in edit mode, right? Our simple Rex script that gets some information, gets the, the sysplex ID for the system out of the system variables, executes the LU command, traps all that output in the LU stem and just, you know, says it out. 
So I hope we can all see when I run this, we get our simple script. We get some information out I'm running on the ADCD PL system. Now you all know I'm running on the ZPDT um, and some LU information for the user IBM user, which is the user I'm logged on with. Pretty straightforward. What about this? We've got this same gibberish at top, that same two weird functions. Now I have to pray to the demo gods, obviously, but when we execute this, we get the same output. So back to our slides, that's a success. Right, we can we can totally obfuscate Rex code. Um, if you want to see it happening live, maybe, maybe I show this as well because you're thinking that took you ages to prepare. But um, sorry, I'm having trouble understanding. Oh, sorry, Alexa. Please try a little later. That's it. Sorry. Right. So this um, this script takes the. Um, takes an input script, an output rec script, and it does all that mumbo jumbo stuff to create another rex that looks like gibberish. Now, if we would delete this hello BF file, yep. And maybe, let's see. Here's hello. Edit. Yes, so you know we're not faking it, right? Hello, GSE UK. Haha, <laughs> that fits. We run our obfuscator. I get back in. I've you know just created this hello BF file again that has some gibberish. And when we execute this, it says hello GSE UK. There. So obfuscation is um, you know. We check the box, we've done it. Code hiding. Hiding of code, like I said, the malware does it again to, to you know lower their chances of getting caught, lower their chances of people finding a fix for the malware because the actual code is, is hard to be found. And there are a couple of ways of doing this. Um, there was a really good session last year um, by Christian that covered some steganography things. For those of you who don't know what that is, go and rewatch those slides. But basically, it's it's hiding stuff inside of other things, right? So you can have an image and just use some data bits to, to store some data that are not part of the image. You don't see them when you look at the PNG file. But with the proper software, you can still read that PNG file and get that, you know, that evil piece of executable code out of there or credit card numbers or passwords, or whatever. Um, you can also hide it in plain text, right? Just stick it in between something. Um, one of the really cool things that I've seen is white space. I think it's an actual programming language as well, but it's basically all the code is white space. So one space means nothing, two spaces means, I don't know, print, three spaces means, and, it, and you can construct your code just with white space. Um, you could take your, you know, your payload, your evil malware stuff and encrypt it so people can't um, easily find it. You can host it remotely, you know, download it, run it, delete it again. Um, so I thought, why not build something? And I thought of the name Rexception, right? Can I hide a Rex inside of a Rex? Uh, turned out that was, you know, easy peasy lemon squeezy. I read a target Rex, which is like our, our, our base, you know, our, our Coke. Um, I read the Rex we want to hide, our uh, I don't know, or Bacardi or something, and we mix that up to get a nice little mixed drink where we don't know which parts are the Coke and which parts are the Bacardi. Um, we make sure that we do it in such a way we can extract the original again, and we've successfully hidden some code. So let's try that. Um, right, I have a little script designed called Stino it, right? It takes um, it takes our hello world script, which is now hello GSE UK, and 
um, it takes our, our mixer, which is Arch, Mets, whatever Rex that is, and it creates a Steenode result file. So if we first look at um, this file, right, it's, a, it's just a random Rex that does something. We can run it if we want. Ex. But it, it just gets all the sysexec data sets out of um, out of the system. Nothing more. Our hello world script is still the same, right? We don't need to check that one. I will delete this thing. So I was testing the demo up front, obviously. And we're gonna execute our thing. Just get back in again. We've created this file, right, which is still recognizable, the recs that we had earlier, but at the bottom you can see there's some weird curly lines, and then that's where our original rex is. Some more curly lines. This is, you know, the dividers uh, to say where, where the bit is that we've hidden, hidden, right? Um, and then the downside is when you accidentally run this script, right? Of course it doesn't work because there's all this gibberish in it. Um, and with our unsteno script, right, we can um, create a steno with zero file that will get that hidden code out of there again for execution. So when I run this, Back to get that file, Steno at zero. It has extracted that hidden Rex from that, that piece of gibberish. But then I remembered there's there's other cool ways to, to hide code, right? Because this is um, this is nice, but it's still very readable on what's happening. I remember a talk by um, Fullnet a couple of years ago who analyzed malware. Um, showed us what it did, and it you can see at the bullet there, it does the C2 protocol via DNS. So what this malware was doing, it was making DNS requests for URLs, getting the IP address back, and doing something with it to create code. That was it was I think it's from a technological point, amazing. Um, it kind of looked like this. This is this is the slide I had to get of him, Jamie, in our uh, our talk just before it started, right? So. If you'd have an IP address 99.97.108.99 and you would interpret those octets as ASCII code, it would spell out calc, right? Um, so you could you know, do a DNS lookup for blah, 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 dot example dot com, get the IP address, parse it as ASCII and stick the parsed ASCII in like a command executor and you can build your command. Uh, you can see 121.111, blah, 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 and that for forms PowerShell. And the actual code for PowerShell, so the words PowerShell, are nowhere to be found in the code. Now that got me thinking, can we do that on the mainframe? All right, so can I have this piece of Rex? I start out simple. It's one of the most advanced Rexes I've written recently, A equals 10. And we take our EBCDIC table I go and find all those, you know, characters that make up the Rex code, A equals 10, C1, 70, F1, F0. Parse those out to numbers. And I get 193.126.241.240. So if you would make some URL.com point to that IP address, that URL basically means A equals 10, four bytes per DNS entry. Pretty amazing. Turns out that this is an actual DNS entry at novice.pt. I don't know what the PT top level domain is, top of my head, but this URL actually exists, right? So if we want to hide our code in DNS entries, all we need to do is find the correct URLs and, and we're golden. No, we can't do that on ZOS now, can we? Portugal, thanks, Christian. Uh, the PT domain is Portugal. But what about this piece of Rex? Right? Just simple socket, um, socket stuff in Rex. 
where we get a host by name for a DNS entry. We get the IP address, we chop it up at the dots, do a D2C to turn that decimal into a character and we've reconstructed the, the text from the URL. Let's do a little demo. This is my favorite bit. Right, so I have a piece of code here that says run at your own risk, obviously, um, where we have three domain names, weird ones, but hey, who cares? That are parsed into this IP24B function that I've shown you earlier, you know, the one that takes the domain name gets the octets of the IP address and, you know, returns the string of data that it should um, represent. And then there's more domain names there, all funky domain names. It's quite a long Rex. I'll we'll just, you know, max F down. Of course, I've added some gibberish at the end so that you don't see the real function here. Uh, that's you know, just hiding. It doesn't do anything that code, but uh, like the, the comments at the start said, run this at your own risk. Now, if you would see this code on your system, would you feel comfortable running it? What would happen if we run it? It is not really apparent, but when I execute this, it's going to go out to DNS, get some IP addresses back, and do whatever is in those IP addresses. And now it's just printing out a nice little skull and bones on my screen. Um, it could do something totally different, right? Um, take a look again at the, um, the heart of this thing, right? Um, this piece of code you've seen, it's in the slides. And the only thing the code does is takes that line and interprets it, right? So it builds that string and it runs it. Now, this is cool on, um, I think, a on a couple of reasons. For one, I think it's pretty cool just to be able to run code based on DNS entries, but from, from an attacker perspective um, and a defender perspective, how will you know what has been run? Because the minute I package my evil code in a truckload of DNS entries and I run it, and then I get off your system and I stole your, I don't know, stuff or I encrypted your VSAMs, whatever. How are you going to analyze what I've done? Because I all I have to do is change those DNS entries to point to 0, .0, 0.0.0. You still have that code, you know, this code is still on your machine, but you, you can't reconstruct what IP addresses were actually returned by those DNS entries. I don't know a lot of companies that, um, you know, log all DNS queries. And out of those that do, I don't think anyone logs the results. So it's it's a very volatile way of, of getting your code out there, running it, and, and nobody's ever able to find how that how that code got constructed. Of course, you don't want to do this manually, right? You don't want to start, you know, figuring it out and calculating and creating DNS entries. Um, or finding ones. Um, so I wrote a little script, which is, it's out there on GitHub somewhere, um, where you can input some recs and a top level domain. You can see it at the top here, I think, right? Um, I'm saying create from that input file. I think it's yeah, test.recs. Use the top level domain gse.org.uk. Sorry, Jamie. Um, also try and find real DNS entries um, and encrypt this code for me. Right, so um, it then gives you a list of real IP addresses it found and um, DNS entries you need to create. So if you know if gse.org.uk would add these entries to their DNS, you could run this code and it would do something. And I forgot kind of what it is, but I think this one says hello GSE. I think. Um, all right, that's the link to the to the GitHub repo there. So another success, this didn't make me really happy. Uh, we've got obfuscating, we've got code hiding. Now, how about self-replication? Uh, I did a long talk on creating a virus at a STEM event at Wolverhampton last year, I think. Um, these are just some slides out of it, but just to get a, another grasp of you know, what 
what that infection bit and the self-replication bit of, of viruses is, it's, it's kind of this workflow. And of course, you can bring your own payload to, to get into that virus as well. But it's basically, you know, find a target to infect, copy, you know, the virus to some stub, add the target that you found to it as well, overlay it back, and you have infected something. Now, if you are able to add your infection code to the, you know, the one you're, you're infecting, you've got self-replicating code. Pretty cool stuff. Um, if we look at that in Python, just a quick um, quick overview on, on how to, you know, to mold pies in uh, with Python. Uh, you get all your Python files in the, you know, this, this virus just infects everything. Um, you know, that copy virus to stop bit is where, um, you know, where we create a copy, like a temporary file, if you wish, to, um, to put our virus in. And our virus is here, not just the comment line, this pie has molded. Then we read the original file, append it to that one, and then delete the original file, rename the stub to the original file, and we have infected ourselves. Or at least we've infected um, it with that piece of code. Then you need to do some extra things, you know, make sure you don't infect yourself. Don't infect things that have already been infected or, you know, your binaries will, will grow and grow and grow. And we have to, instead of run the line, this pie has molded, at least in this example, we need to put all of our code into that string. And then you have self-replicating code. Now, I hope we all think that's impossible. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't. So... I do have to copy some files over because I hope you can all imagine doing the research. And I did break a couple of my own systems trying to figure this out where it, you know, I had my palm lip broken and stuff busted. So I'm going to copy some stuff. I'm going to copy our, I think our hello world, our simple script and our virus. Eight, right. And we're going to copy that to ah, that's good enough. Over that fear. Right, so now we have we have our hello world script copied over, which is still hello GSE UK that we can execute, and it says right, it all works. Then don't want to show you all this code. This is the part I'm not willing to share. But um, when I run this Rex, it's done. But now if we take a look at our hello world, there's a whole bunch of extra stuff in here. And when we run it, it says, hey, I'm infected. Our payload has been added to the script and it still does the original thing saying hello GSE UK. Same for our, remember our simple, simple list Rex, also infected and it still does the original thing. Now if we make a, a test file, Rex and what is it we do here? Rex. just execute this and it does what it does. Now, suppose we run our hello world script again, infected. Now, our test script is infected too. This um, proof of concept, Rex virus, ooh, scary. Um, only X in the PDS it's run from. Um, that's one of the lessons I learned building this because at one stage I had infected every single Rex on my machine to say the line infected at the start. That's not a happy place. Luckily, it was only that, right? But um, for now, it only it only finds Rexes in the um, in the PDS it's ran from. Of course, that could be easily changed. Another success. Um, 
Are we good on time? Ooh, we're 15 minutes. So I have to rush through this one quickly um, just to show you how you can package your stuff as well, because you know, you, you get your Rexes and some scripts, maybe some load modules, some JCL, and you, you want an easy way through DNS lookups or whatever to, to bring that to the target system in one go. Um, and this is what you, what you normally would see in, in you know, the distributed world where they take their entire payload, stick it in a script, just as text, and have the script read itself to unpack the stuff and, and run it, or at least make it available. Uh, I hooked a little script for that as well. I will quickly show you. That is here. I think. Right, so I have a hello world script um, in a demo folder. I could stick XMIT files there, other directories, but for example sake, there's only one file in here I want to package. Um, so I do have my steps I need to run, so I don't have to type as much. What? Right. So I'm gonna run my package script, I hope. Yep, I am going to package that demo folder. And I'm going to store it in the out folder. Done. Now in this out folder, I only have one file, which is called receive.sh, right, which is like you've seen in the slides. Um, it finds the packed data, then it UU decodes it into a PAX file, it unpacks that file, and we have everything in a dist folder. And here's that data of gibberish again. So the minute we would run receive. It has created, I've left the files here just so you can see what's happening, but it creates this dist folder that has the original hello world in it. So time for panic, right? All that stuff just works on our precious ZOS and this is just Rex, right? I'm not even covering assembly code or compiled code. Uh, and it's just the, the, the tricks that those malware guys use are fully functional on ZOS. I got a bit panicked at least. Right, so I'm fearing one of these days I'm going to log on to my TSO session and I get this log on screen. Right, everything's encrypted. Sorry, start paying. Um, for anybody who likes it, I do have this compiled as a USS tab you can stick on your machine. It is really funny to scare people on installation systems. Right, so we need to detect malware, we need to respond to it, and we preferably need to protect ourselves. Um, this is basically the simplified NIST framework, right? Um, so how do we detect malware, right? We need virus scanners, but do we have those on ZOS? I haven't heard of a virus scanner product, but maybe we start needing one. Um, file integrity monitoring. There was a really good session earlier this week by Al Soret on uh, file integrity monitoring, something that would definitely help you detect if, if stuff starts changing or if all of a sudden, you know, all your Rexes have a say infected at the start. Um, maybe you want to do sandbox test runs of everything. I don't know. Are you aware to, to weird behavior on your system? Do you see a lot of extra I.O.? Because you can imagine that virus thing scanning through PDSs and adding stuff. I mean, that's a lot of extra I.O. you could potentially see. Maybe you have buttloads of ICH 408Is appearing, right? And I started typing these slides and then I was, you know, rehearsing and I thought, can I use the word buttloads? Is that proper? Turns out it's a regional English measure of capacity, right? It's an official term, so nothing wrong with me saying buttloads. It's my new word of choice for now, I think, when it comes to a lot. Um, but there are options to detect it, right? Even without buying software or installing software, I think the awareness is um, be aware of stuff happening on your system. Now, how do we respond? How do we respond to malware? 
basically we kill it with fire, right? You have to get rid of it, destroy that stuff. Uh, the best way to unwant something. And I kind of like that picture. So get rid of the malware, but preferably you're also a bit more like Liam here, um, but you have to find out where it came from, right? Because how did it get on your system? Who put it there? Maybe when was it put there? That's something you need to do as well. Um, and how do we protect? Well, we check things, educate your users, educate yourself, check authorizations, right? Because you've seen I've ran, I was running all these rec scripts as IBM user, which is a you know pretty pretty authorized user in the system. Um, but just check stuff, right? Are you checking every successful read? Probably not, but maybe you should on 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 some um, some resources. Do you have groups of TSO users who share group um, procedure libraries, right? And I've worked at clients where, you know, you have this, this little add-on to your logon script that everybody has read write access to. So you can easily stick in your own tools. Well, tool or malware is the same thing. You can stick in a nice piece of, you know, one of those examples and um, life is not so funny anymore. In case of fear of ransomware, maybe you need to start offloading your backups, like physically get them away um, so that the malware can't you know, destroy your backups as well. Test your recovery scenarios. And again, offensive sandboxing is something I would strongly suggest if, if you have doubts or fear. Um, this is a slide from uh, Bart, one of the slides and presentations I used for my research. And he closed up with this recap. Um, it's almost completely the same for us on the mainframe platform, right? It can assume many forms. Yes, it doesn't discriminate. You have malware for most modern operating systems. Luckily, I think we don't have malware for the modern ZOS yet. Um, I hope it doesn't get there, but um, when it does, we need to be ready. It can exist cross-platform. Think of a malicious macro in Word, um, right? It's scary stuff. I read this as that. Right. It can be a malicious macro in an ISPF edit macro that will totally get you. That being said, a little quote from Myra Grant. There's nothing so patient in this world or any other as a virus searching for a host. Right? They, they, they have the time. It can be, you know, I don't know what the word is, but it can be dormant in your system for a long time. So, yeah, my advice to you is be careful out there. Check your stuff and um, be, be aware. This morning, for instance, I got scared a lot because this is what the conference website looked like. Um, of course, that doesn't run on a mainframe and I don't think it was malware, but just a hiccup, but uh, just, just to state that things can go wrong. And this, I hope the organization also had the worry of, oh, what happened here, right? Be aware and, and check your things. I'm really curious to your feedback. So use the feedback form, please. Um, thank you very much. For your attention, I think. Thank you, Henry. And I'll leave Perfect. you with the charity slide and some questions, maybe. Yeah, so any questions for Henry? If you want to, uh, I can unmute your line if you want to post something in the chat. Uh, while we're uh, waiting for, for questions to come through, uh, Henry, so I mean, there's three things there that sprung to mind here is. Um, like Unix system services, we forget, you know, that that's there. I mean, you can't run a mainframe these days without it. And uh, and so many different services depend on it. And we just, I think we, knowing what I know about some of the, you know, the audits that I've taken and, and pen tests I've been involved with in the past, just how exposed Unix system services is a very convenient backdoor to putting, you know, code in. Um, I think the second thing is like the, I don't think we really do proper code reviews anymore. You know, we, you know we, we copy things up, Rexes and stuff. I think we really trust people. You know, it goes for the change control system. And, and so for me, that, that, that I don't think that go, that's not a, an effective process. And, and I think the third thing is, you know, this whole need for code signing and, you know, and I know IBM has taken steps to enable that now. Um, so yeah, it's just some thoughts there. Um, yeah. On the additional steps, you know. Yeah. There is, there is indeed, and yep, it's precisely what, you, and that's why I closed off with that that packaging set of slides, um, precisely to to get that thought going, which 
at least work with you. So hopefully with a couple of other attendees as well, right? If you take all those, you know, some some smarty or or evil rec scripts, a bit of JCL, some assembly, some stuff. You package that up neatly with that you know that package script. That's so much more easier to get your stuff on a mainframe than using I don't know NDD transfer, XMIT files, upload stuff. That that the USS is also a very big. Um, I wouldn't call a tech factor, but it's it's a very. Hmm, a very open interface, let's put it this way, and often, <laughs> and often forgot in, in reviews, in security checks. Um, yeah, just stuff to, but that I think we all should pay a bit more attention to. Yeah, absolutely. Like I say, it's, um, it's, another, it's another door in. Um, and uh, yeah. So any questions? Uh, we've still got a little bit of time left until the top of the hour. Um, uh, so I have a, okay. So a comment from uh, from Ian. Um, it says, funnily enough, the company I worked for thirty years ago did worry about a virus on the mainframe. So okay, interesting. Very really good. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not trying to fear monger here, right? I hope um, I hope you all realise this is, um, of course, low level research. Um, I think it will be it will be quite some time before you can really what would be the correct word. Um, arm this stuff to you know really really execute an attack um i don't want to have anything to do with that to be honest <laughs> um, but i do want to i don't want to not say the dangers that i see um so yeah anyone interested in the code please do contact me um but don't contact me for that that virus code because i'm just not feeling too comfortable on it because it, it sometimes <laughs> scares me a bit um so yeah there That's was a fun. kind of there was a like a was there a story was it back in the 90s of a virus or was it a printer so maybe someone can uh, you know post in the the, the chat around uh, there was a there was some mainframe code that got posted that's right chris what was it christmas exec yeah oh, thank you mark mark nelson thank you uh, yes and, and i can't remember what it did I just remember I was working in an insurance company at the time and I was working in the claims department and I'm, I remember printers went mad. The, 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 the printers connected to the mainframe went mad mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. That was probably so, what I would call a noiware. Yeah, so I'm gonna unmute Mark's line because I'm sure he's dying to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hi Mark. There. Yes. Hey. Uh, it, yeah, I, it was a uh, small piece of, uh, I can't remember if it was Rex or exec code, but what it did is it displayed a pretty picture of a Christmas tree. It came around uh, Christmas time and uh, on your 3270 device, and then it sent a copy of itself to everybody in your names file or whatever the equivalent of that file was. Cool. And that, that was the issue. It was simply, it was a lot of network traffic, a lot of network traffic. Uh, okay. So it's something different to what I was thinking about then. There was some printer... So it's something that went that sent the printers mad, but maybe it was a distributed thing. I don't know. Yeah, I was using a dumb terminal in those days. That's why I remember it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, so Ian. Things. And um, yeah, the other warning that I deleted from my my tips to not get um, you know not get on the wrong side of these things, but don't blatantly get stuff. And I know I'm a Ziggy enthusiast because I built the thing on open sourcing mainframe stuff and getting mainframe code out on GitHub and CBT tape, but don't just go get it and run it, right? I wrote an installer script for Git, right? That takes all the stuff from Rocket and then kind of makes it a one line install to make life easier, which is a shell script. And um, I made that shell script available through GitHub, but I gave it the option. If you don't run the script with minus minus not stupid, it will pop out this very big banner saying, what the hell have you done? Did you just download stuff from the internet and ran it on your mainframe without checking the code? Please check the code on how to run this. And I actually had a couple of people contact me through either Twitter or an email going, oh, that was a good wake up call because it crashed for me. I didn't use the minus minus not stupid flag, <laughs> which proves my point that some people, no offense to the ones who did, will take that code and just run it. Now, what if that was some of those nasty codes? Yeah. So, so yeah, 
be um, be vigilant and be use um, an extra portion of common sense is what I would say. Of course. Oh, uh, Ian, uh, you've got a question for us. Your lines are muted. Go ahead. Uh, no, it's actually not a question, but um, more of a, a noiware. Um, there used to be, a, I think, a 3800 printer, and you could send a code to it, which would open the cover. It used to be one of those printers that, for sound reasons, was you, know, you could close the cover and it would be quite quiet. And I remember, um, certainly in the company I worked for, that people would send this code to the, uh, in just in an ordinary print, and it would open the, the printer, and the operators would then have to go and sort of deal with it. Why is it open? It would normally open if there was an error, but um, so they would walk over to the printer. There's a printed page there, nothing wrong with it. So they'd close the printer and start printing again. After a little while, if you sent another one, it would open the printer lid again. Of course, um, the printers, the operators would go mad, wondering why this printer would keep opening its lid. So wow, was so it wasn't patient. just a. Yeah, it wasn't just 3800s, the 1403, if you overprinted an underscore so many times and then did a page eject, it would cause the pages separate and the cover would majestically rise. And of course, anything on top of the printer would then be tossed to the floor. So as a student in college, we would wait till the operators had stuff piled on there, submit the print job and hilarity ensued. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I, I suppose you put that under the category of availability, wouldn't you? Uh, as in the operators weren't available to do what they're paid to do, you know, and uh, all the good work they're doing, they've kind of diverted to do something else. They're wasting their time. And yeah, yeah. But, um, thank you. Any more thoughts before we uh, finish up? May I see one, Nagendra. Sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. Can we use the infected member's timestamp and size to track the member modified of data sets? Yeah, yeah, you, you could. Right, that's basically what, um, in a nutshell, what that what I meant with the file integrity monitoring and keeping track on changes. Um, yeah, you could. Uh, yeah. I'm thinking I could even make that in my virus a bit smarter to check the ISPF statistics and make it easier to see if I need to reinfect this thing or not. Uh, thanks for the tip. It's got that's you thinking there, Henry. <laughs> zero. Yeah. Okay, so Henry, thank you so much for taking us through that, uh, oh. I would say thought provoking, <laughs> don't have nightmares folks, um, session. So uh, like I said, Henry uh, will probably be back with us next year for one of our security working group meetings, or at least I hope you will with a, with a, uh, with a session for us, that would be great. Um, so yeah, don't forget, uh, Henry, thank you very much for reminding me, the, uh, the charity, if you could donate to that, whatever you can afford, um, use the QR code or the URL there to take you to the, uh, the link to take that payment. Um, this is session 5AN for the purpose of feedback. Um, don't forget to leave uh, feedback. Uh, you can go to the agenda, click on Henry's session and uh, go right to the bottom and you'll see the feedback link there and uh, it will take you to the, uh, the the relevant page. Like I said, I keep you're going to be sick of me saying this by the end of this conference, but I say it's important for not only Henry and, and any of the presenters that you're leaving feedback for, um, but it's also important for the way that you know we shape the conference going forward. And don't forget for those of you that want a CPE or CPD certificate, um, to uh, the feedback is built, uh, that the certificate is built off the feedback that you give. So it's really, really important. So we've got a break now um, until 1.30, that's 1.30 GMT folks. Um, and then we will uh, resume with some more sessions. Um, just as a little FYI, there's a 101 session going, which is an introduction to ZOS. So if you're kind of relatively new into the mainframe world, um, then this might be a really good session for you to uh, attend. So that's at, uh, also at 1.30. The next security session today, folks, is at three o'clock. Um, and that's going to be with one of Mark Nelson's colleagues, Ross Cooper, who's going to uh, talk us about, well, basically the session is everything you've ever wanted to know about rack listing and way, way more. Um, so that's definitely a session I would uh, encourage you to attend. I've been using, you know, we've been using rack listing for years and uh, it kind of just works. <laughs> so if you want to know what's going on under the covers, that's uh, definitely a session to, uh, to attend. So thanks everybody for attending. Thanks for your contributions, for the comments as well. Like for all you know, sessions, do keep putting those 
comments in the uh, in the chat um, and, and and keep asking those questions. We all learn from you know the responses that we get from those questions, of course. And Henry, like I say, once again, a big big thank you for the preparation that you've now put into your session. Really, really excellent session, and uh, look forward to having you back at GSE again. Thank you. So thanks, Next everybody. Time we'll do it non-virtual, Jamie. Sorry. Next time we will do it non-virtual. I hope so. Yes, we'll get back there one day, folks. <laughs> All right. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye-bye. Okay. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.